lo que consiguió, vamos a entrar de lleno con en la oscuridad Star Trek, estreno 10 de mayo, va a salir alrededor de 800 copias. Vamos a entrar, digo, van a entrar en un formato IMAX, 4DX, 3D, 2D, que pues va a estar en general en todo lo que más ustedes busquen. Vamos a arrancar con esto. Cada quien, por favor, para ir, nada más terminando el orden o volviendo a comentar el orden, se tiene una serie de paletas con los números, vamos a ir por números, ¿ok? Para que no haya rebatos de palabras ni de nada, ya las preguntas son, ya las preguntas se pueden meter a la gente que quiere hacer preguntas, ¿ok? Pues yo nada más voy a darle pie a esos números. ¿Estamos de acuerdo? Para que no haya ningún problema. ¿Ok? Entonces vamos a empezar, vamos a empezar, vamos a empezar. Vamos a empezar. Primero que nada, por favor, un fuerte aplauso a Zoe Santana. Bueno, después de nuevo está el director, J.J. Allen. El actor, Chris Park. Y finalmente, Maggie Allen. Ya está, así que se relajado. ¿Quién tiene la palabra número uno? ¿Ok? Un favor enorme, hay que ponerse de pie. Nombre, le que me bien. Juan, por favor, para la ¿Ok? Ahí están los niños. ¿Ok? Buenos días, mi nombre es Julio Vélez, del Informador TV. Bienvenidos a México a todos. A la vida y prosperidad. Apenas vi la película anoche, eh, y bueno, sin decir spoilers, esto lo primero lo digo como fan. Eh, de niño yo soñaba mucho, eh, tenía un sueño recurrente, eh, que veía que el cielo y que veía el Enterprise, y ayer me hicieron soñarlo de nuevo, muchas gracias. Ahora me quito en la camisa de X y mis preguntas son las siguientes. No quiero dar spoilers eh, eh, respecto a mis compañeros de prensa de lo que se ve en la película, entonces no lo, no lo haré, pero quiero rodearlo eh, preguntándoles, me pareció fascinante eh, eh, el resto del de, de, de elenco, la forma en la que los eventos de la película anterior siguen teniendo repercusión en la forma en la que cambian las cosas en la segunda, relacionadas con la serie original. Se me hace muy inteligente y muy interesante, y que no obstante es una película que puede verse sin haber visto la anterior. ¿Cómo lograron esto y cómo establece las bases para una posible secuela? Uh, uh... The goal for us was to make a film that was a standalone movie, meaning you didn't need to see the first film we did or the, the original series. Um, but if, like yourself, you're a Star Trek fan, you get rewarded for knowing certain things, relationships, characters. Um, but the goal was to make a movie uh, for movie goers uh, that, that might not know anything about Star Trek. It's a big action adventure <coughs> throw ride with characters that I think you can meet in this film and still fall in love with. Uh, but thank you very much for your your time. Gracias. Si me lo permites, solamente en cuanto al 3D, ha sido un hito. Creo que va a suceder hasta este este viernes que se estrene, en que las películas modificadas para que se vean en 3D no tienen la misma calidad que cuando son rodadas. Definitivamente, desde mi de percepción, esto cambia con lo que hicieron ustedes. ¿Cómo lograron esa profundidad y el proceso tecnológico para que se viera así de impresionante sin haber sido rodada con cámaras? Gracias. Gracias. The, the approach was to um, use some techniques that had not been used before in 3D. I often get headaches watching 3D, and uh, we have an amazing team led by uh, a stereographer named Corey Turner, who has worked on a lot of movies. And he wanted to try some things that, that he had not had a chance to do before, including finding ways to minimize some of the eye strain that can happen. And also because we shot nearly a quarter of the film in IMAX, which is a huge format, the resolution of the image is extraordinary. And that plus the 3D and these new techniques, I think, make for a pretty cool visual experience. Okay. Eh, hola, ¿qué tal? Soy Luis G.I.G. de Intermedia. Eh, 
mi pregunta va para JJ y tiene que ver con el hecho de que, bueno, se habla muy bien y hemos visto digamos, un excelente trabajo en Star Trek y por obvias razones hay una gran expectativa en lo que sucederá con Star Wars. Para ti, ¿qué se siente trabajar en dos de las franquicias de ciencia ficción más importantes? Franquicias con las que seguramente, con muchos de nosotros, tú también creciste. Um. Uh, <laughs> I'm very excited to uh, be working on, on Star Trek. The, the, I was never a Star Trek fan growing up, but I've come to love it. I'm very excited to be working uh, in uh, the Star Wars universe. I was a huge fan of that series uh, since I was 11 years old. Um, we're just getting started on that, so obviously I can't really talk about Star Wars at all, except to say that uh, everyone involved is really uh, pretty inspiring. Um, but I will say that it will be an incredibly tough act to follow uh, after working with these people and the crew and the rest of the cast on Star Trek. We, we were incredibly blessed, all of us, to work together. And uh, I, I, it was one of the main reasons I wanted to come back originally, was to get to work with these people again. Um, and then have the experience be of challenging the movie so big and, and yet, I think, uh, very emotional and funny. And to get to work with these people and learn All of us from each other was really incredible to Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And we're going to go to the next one. And we're going to go to the next one. Okay. Thank you. Mi nombre es Laura Ángeles de Tenacino Nervo y es un buen momento para el elenco. La primera es, ¿qué les ha dejado estar frente a ustedes como personas? Eh, sus personajes, ¿qué es lo que han aprendido de sus, de sus personajes? Y la segunda, eh, ¿podrían contarnos alguna anécdota dentro de, del rodaje? Ladies first. Um, I think I'm going to take this back. Um, there's a lot to learn from Star Trek because it's such a well constructed universe already. Um, and if you imagine the future, if you try and do that, it's a very difficult thing to do. And I think the detail with which Team Rosie really did it is kind of mind blowing. So I learned a lot from that. I also learned a lot from working with JJ, whose energy um, continues throughout the day, however late you're working. Um, And also it's nice to see a part of a group of people, you know, we've gone around the world and we've talked and filmed and shared it with people and that's been a very special experience for me. And then the second part of your question I've forgotten because there's so many of you here. I'll leave that to Chris, I think you've got the best time. Chris? <laughs> um, I, uh, I've learned a great deal from uh, from Jim Kirk. Uh, I enjoy his spirit of adventure and the fact that he, he wears his heart and his grief for, for the most part. Um, uh, you know, his strengths are his weaknesses, unfortunately. You know, if, he, if he's angry, he, he's really angry. If he's really sad, he's going to be really sad. He's a, a confrontational uh, man, and I appreciate that about him. And I also think it's that impulsiveness and that lack of a sense of that he uh, get in trouble a lot. And the great fun uh, for me in this one is that he, in the first I got to play the uh, character that was so self-assured and so confident and so very much what I thought to be a born leader, uh, but a man that really uh, had to get in touch with himself a lot more in this film in the first 15 minutes you find him kind of struck down the ground zero, broken apart, uh, a man whose self-assuredness is um, Uh, replaced by an incredible amount of self-doubt and that kind of existential crisis he finds himself in. If he's good enough, can I do this? Was I going to be a leader? Am I a good enough captain? I thought the real, the real challenge and the beauty of playing this character is that he was a weak hero. To have a weak hero try to lead these men and women into battle, um, uh, scratching and straws really uh, was very exciting for me. So he was different than I remember him. Um, anécdota. Yo creo que disfrutamos tanto eh, colaborando juntos. Eh, JJ establece una línea de, de, de humor, de confianza y, um, y también de mucha disciplina. Por lo tanto, sabes que no va a ir al trabajo a, a, a dar lo mejor de ti, pero lo vas a usar en cada momento. 
eh, la bendición de, de usted ser parte de, de una franquicia que, que ha sido tan impactante por más casi, casi 50 años. Es el mensaje que, que, que Jim Andre creó para este concepto, el mensaje de paz. Él imaginó lo imaginó, lo imaginó, lo imaginó, ¿cómo se dice la palabra? Sí, pero um, él, él quiso ver en un mundo utopian, él quiso ver a un ruso, a un japonés, una señora de ascendencia negroamericana, trabajando todos juntos por, con el propósito de paz, no solamente en la tierra, pero, pero en el espacio. Y eso fue algo muy revolucionario y también que inspiró a muchas personas. Yo creo que por eso es que las franquicias están están bien queridas globalmente y ha podido vivir hasta ahora, hasta caer en manos de los directores como Jayden, que su presencia la respetó y esa fue la experiencia que siempre mantuvo pendiente todos los días cuando íbamos a trabajar, a hacer nuestro personal y a hacer la película. ¿Quién sigue? ¿Estamos? Por acá. ¿Cuatro? ¿Cuatro? ¿Nombre? Por acá está Carrido de Associated Press. Para todo, a mí me gustaría saber, ahorita que hablas de toda esta convivencia del melting pot que te plantea en el, en el espacio, siendo tú la única latina del elenco o una de las latinas, ¿qué crees que le trajiste de, de adicional a la teniente Ujura? ¿La hiciste más sexy? ¿No se le diste más personalidad? Uh, for JJ, I have a question for you. Could you please clarify if there's going to be a third movie of Star Trek because Paramount has shown interest? And how would it be like, you know, creating two universes based on the galaxy at the same time? Um, I think that, yo creo que lo que ayudó para yo hacer mi personaje más respetado, más eh, que fuera solamente autónomo, que fuera completamente autónomo a lo que yo soy como persona, es el no haber pensado en eso para nada. Porque se sabe que conscientemente uno siendo artista le va, va a haber, tra, va a haber cualidades o cosas tuyas que lamentablemente o afortunadamente le vas a dar al personaje que estás haciendo. Por lo tanto, mi trabajo como artista es mantener una neutralidad para que ustedes puedan sumergirse en los personajes y no verme a mí tras ellos. Yo creo que la, lo que le incorporé fue la producción y fue más interna. El saber que soy una, mucha, una mujer y también de descendencia latina y el llegar o me he llegado a trabajar y colaborar con el artista, con artistas con los que estoy compartiendo la tarea en estos momentos es una bendición que alguna vez se me despierta de noche de tanto agradecimiento que siento porque sé que en cualquier momento si, si el universo se hubiera movido de un, de un grado hacia un lugar o a otro mi, mi destino hubiera sido diferente y estoy bien bendecida de que estoy aquí y yo siento que es lo que más le puedo dar a mi gente es mantener neutralidad porque así llego más lejos y si ya se sabe que soy latina, por lo tanto quiero que todo el mundo se inspire, artistas, a que no quieran entrar por cualquier puerta porque son latinas, sino entrar porque tienen mérito de excelencia, al igual que cualquier persona de cualquier otra cultura, y que se yo so happen to be sabio latino. <risa> I will just say to that end that one of the great things about Star Trek is it's inclusive. It's, it's all of us uh, together and uh, there are a lot of characters who represent a lot of cultures and a lot of people and I will say the thing that you will say which is that as the, the, the one character who sort of represents people of Latin descent, I will say that you know, Zoe is, uh, is brilliant, uh, beautiful and badass. And uh, <laughs> she's not going to work with it and represent, I think, humanity beautifully. Um, I would say in terms of the, the, the Star Trek, uh, the third uh, film, we're, you know, having sort of casual conversations about uh, what a third film would be, but there has been no formal conversation. And if there is a, a, a third one, depending on the, the timing of my guess is that I would be involved as a producer uh, and, and likely not a, 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 the director, but all of us uh, involved really have come to love this group of people and this world. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I care too much about it and I would ever um, not be involved in it. Um, but it's something that there are, the great thing about this, this Star Trek uh, series is the possibilities are essentially limited of what can happen. So there are huge and wonderful adventures uh, ahead for this group. I, I'm confident. ¿Vale, entonces, número 5?
Yeah, I can. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first of all, as a fan, thank you so much. Dan, this is a movie. Uh, right, right. Um, it's a two part question, actually, uh, for all of you. When Gene Roddenberry started out on this journey, he set out to tell new human stories in a really different way. Do you think you've accomplished this and how? And you, JJ, what pages have you taken from the Roddenberry book to accomplish this? Thank you. Um, I think that uh, both JJ and Dean Rodenberry um, understand um, the importance of family. I think Dean Rodenberry um, made an eclectic family, um, as Zoe was saying, comprised of all different cultures on the enterprise, which at the time was groundbreaking. And I think that was very important in itself. And then I think JJ picks that up in and makes us all become human beings that have feelings and that matter to each other. And I think that those journeys are the journeys that connect to the people. And, you know, I cried three times when I first did the film. So there's definitely a, a huge element of love in the story. I think it's a very important part of the story, is love and which direction does your love go. And I, I enjoy playing that part of it very much. That is an actor is the most rewarding. Yeah, I think there's a hopefulness to the world that Gene Roddenberry had that, that there's, a, there's an earnest belief that humanity can achieve great things when they work together. And even though this is called Star Trek in the Darkness, um, there is, uh, you know, my character at the end has a, a moment to, to, that I hope is not too didactic, but it, it's definitely food for thought for, for people that have experienced pain and have experienced evil and wanted to seek revenge and have had that blood thirst, unfortunately, we live in a world today where we face terrorism, we face people that inflict this kind of psychological terror, this kind of physical terror upon us, and all these very human feelings and blood things to seek revenge, they're kind of metastasized in this very strong individual who's got errors and he's very much the dark side. And I think it, it, this. This, this story, even though it takes place in the future, is so very earthbound. It's so very much much things that the same issues of our time right now. And it presents us with a choice of two different paths we go down. And I think the great thing about Star Trek is what we say at the end about the five year mission is it's not to go out and seek violence, to seek conflict, to seek divisiveness, to seek those things which break us apart. It's to explore, to find new life, to find new civilizations. And there is something within that that I think, I hope we speak to, I hope set this apart from other, other um, films in, in this genre, and if people want to call it naive or hopeful or earnest or whatever, I have no problem with it because I think it is a lesson, it's a, a version of what our world can be that's always wonderful to hear because unfortunately we always seem to be wanting to tear each other apart for myriad reasons, maybe things on creed and color and race and sexuality and other words, and I think Ron Gray's vision of the hope is very much very much a part of it. Um, can you go to the for a moment? Have you accomplished it? Have you, and how have you accomplished it? How do you feel? Eh, siendo parte de, de esta instalación con JJ, yo creo que, eh, no sé creo, es que ya saben, ya siendo fan del trabajo que ha hecho JJ, ya sea como escritor, como productor, como creador de programas y también dirigiendo eh, varias películas, es que él nunca abandona la humanidad que deben tener los personajes. Porque aunque estamos haciendo una historia que está superlativa, meditativa y bien futurística, todavía son seres humanos que están dirigiendo esta historia. Y eso, esa es la, la, la identificación que tenemos nosotros eh, para poder transportarnos al futuro o retroceder al pasado o simplemente quedarnos aquí en el presente. Entonces, el hacer personajes que son humanos, que tienen miedo, que dudan, que dicen amor, que dicen pérdida, venganza, como dice Craig, pueden estar en un en espacio como pueden estar haciendo en los tiempos de, de, de cadena. Y como quiera, estos sentimientos son completamente identificables. Y eso es lo que más me ha gustado de formar parte de esta este historia. Um, I think, first of all, awesome shirt. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, 
thank you very much for your uh, your enthusiasm for the movie. I, I would say that the uh, we learn lessons every day from what Roddenberry created. Our goal was to was to make a movie that took the spirit with which he created Star Trek uh, and and make it uh, relevant for today. Um, infuse it with a kind of energy and action and fun that I think, frankly, uh, they didn't always have, always have the resources to do in, in you know, 1966. Uh, but I would say that, in fairness, we really tried to make a movie that, that was not imitating what he did at all, but doing its own thing. And that would hopefully, doing it authentically, would celebrate what he created. Uh, we never, in, in props, in sets, in costume, and certainly in performance, ever attempted to do an impersonation of or a recreation of what had happened. Um, we honor and respect and appreciate everything we created and the fans of that, and at the same time we're trying to do something that takes that spirit and boldly goes where no one's gone before. Thank you. Thank you. Está dedicado a crear diversos universos desde Alias, pasando por los. ¿Cuál es el reto particular que enfrentó recrear el universo de Star Trek? Y en esta nueva película, ¿cuál fue para ti el momento más complicado de filmar? Y para su Daniel, ¿usted no hizo hablar en español, en inglés, en y gringo? ¿Cuál fue el proceso para aprender gringo? ¿La aprendiste alguna palabra más de la en la película? ¿Cuánto tiempo llevaste para poder tener esta fonética que se necesita para tener esta cuestión? Gracias. Um, yo no sabía que, que iba a presentar un dote para las lenguas y, y también las lenguas extraterrestres. <risa> Pero <risa> fue algo que con, lo, lo disfruto tanto porque creo que, creo que la niñita dentro de mí que con curiosidad me aproximo a las cosas y no y así puedo removerme o disculpar la presión que se puede añadirme y, y, e impedir de que yo me concentre y me enfoque en lo que tengo que estar haciendo. Es tan... es, es so exciting. De él ya sentarme con, el, con el lengua y que él me diga, no, va. Y yo me digo, ay, Dios mío, ¿qué es esto? ¿Y qué significa esto? Y, y, y um, pero lo aprende, aprende la entonación, aprende lo que significa cada palabra, sabe exactamente lo que tu personaje tiene que hacer en ese momento. Y cuando las cámaras dicen acción, cuando el director dice acción, te metes de cabeza, como hacemos el calibre, y, y lo hace, y le das todo. Y después cuando terminas de hacerlo todo, te pregunta a ver, ¿cómo te fue? Dime una palabra, no sabe más. Y, y eso, eso, es, eso es lo que uno, yo creo que me ha pasado a mí con el Navi y con el Clinton. Palabra que todavía me acuerdo de, de Clinton es back y no sé lo que quiere decir. Pero fue, el profesor fue tan estricto para yo decirla porque es una palabra muy importante para aquellas personas que son, tienen conocimiento del Clinton, que la ensayé tanto que ahora la puedo decir con todos los días, me levanto, la digo, pero no todavía me han mandado que aparezca. I think the biggest challenge in, in working on uh, the Star Trek films has been to uh, approach it with authenticity and to take, again, the spirit of what Ron Baird created and make it work and relevant uh, under high resolution scrutiny today. You know, audiences are incredibly sophisticated, uh, not just in terms of, of, of visuals, but storytelling. And in terms of, of, of recasting these iconic characters, uh, it was a, a massive challenge. But literally to the, the, the department on the film, you know, when you think about the props, when you think about the wardrobe, when you think about the set and the look of it, it was every single time to say, okay, we know what the, the feeling was and what they were trying to do you know, 50 years ago. Great, we understand that. So how do we do that? And, Every actor, uh, I think every designer on the film, really did approach you know, the, uh, their, their responsibility with uh, incredible uh, uh, taste and, and sophistication equal to that of the audience. So that it's easy to say, yeah, yeah, they're wearing those red, blue, and yellow you know, uniforms. But to actually make those uniforms look great and legitimate, especially under IMAX scrutiny, um, to make those sets, the, the running through a red jungle, the, the Enterprise going to 
a futuristic San Francisco having a, a big action sequence in broad daylight in a 300 years future San Francisco or London. These were like, each one of these things were such exciting and delicious challenges. And uh, it's the only way that we could try to make it work, which I think is really true on everything that, that we, we've worked on, is the attempt, the ambition is to do it with a kind of authenticity. Um, and again, I, I'm uh, incredibly grateful, not just to them, but to the, the crew who really had to pull off these minor miracles every time there was a, a massive action set piece, and there are a number of them in the film. Yes, I um, started this thing I was a theory in the 60s and um, I used to watch it with my grandfather when I was young um, and I thought that it was quite male um, and so I used to get a little bit bored but then I developed uh, a crush on William Shatner and then I liked it. Um, and then I didn't think about it again, and then I got invited to join this Star Trek, and now I think it's a very amazing world, and so now it means a lot for me. I mean, I tried to imagine the future, and I really can't do a better job than Dean Rosenberg, so I'm glad to be sort of on this ship. Yeah, I think I answered it before. I really, what I, what I love about this, this this journey making the film and going out and being able to show it to everybody is that it is about a group of people, it's about a group of individuals, it's not Superman, it's not Batman, it's nobody in a cape, it's a family. And I think that that really is what separates it from many other films in the genre. Um, I love the hopefulness of it, I love the spirit behind it, I love the fact that it is fun. We do take time to go around, we do take time to make people laugh. And really, I do think it's important that he said that, I, that while we do kind of adhere to the spirit of what Gene Roddenberry wanted and what Star Trek is all about, this, this wonderful, beautiful, believable, hopefully, science fiction world, the film that we've made, I think, is, is, is in the spirit of wanting to open up that world to many different people. And while we do kind of pay homage, we, we, we respect what we've done before, I, I think that J.J. has done so remarkably well, it made this film accessible by by making it uh, uh, hard to define as an action, comedy, romance, drama, thriller, science fiction extravaganza. This is, this is entertainment at the highest level, but hopefully has that wonderful Ron Brennan uh, new uh, uh, phase line. Thank you. Y me dio como, me, me dio la, el alma de verla a ella chiquita sentada con mi, con mi amiga y su abuelo viendo la serie y imaginándose lo que lo, lo unimaginable. Y eso ella, yo pude heredar eso de ella y me siento mucha gratitud por eso. Para mí ahora, el formar parte de una serie que fue tan impresionante a un nivel tan humano en aquellos tiempos donde paz es una palabra muy difícil de pronunciar en ciertas naciones, como la de Rusia, Japón, los Estados Unidos, y también de una mujer, una mujer negra, sentada con, con muchos hombres, en un barco militar, básicamente, porque aunque está, está hecho en el futuro, es un barco militar, y esta señora tiene un rango de altura, y se ríe con una elegancia y con un respeto que todo el mundo se conduce a ella de esa manera. Y el, y el yo saber ahora que va a venir adelante, yo voy a formar parte de esa, de esa legacy, me siento, la humildad que siento, no, no, no sé cómo describirla en palabras. Uh, they've already answered the question. Uh, so so uh, I would just say that it's, it's a combination of, uh, of the optimism, the humanity, and I think that our job, the essence of, of, of Star Trek is uh, to make a, a movie that, that gives you that, like, the ultimate ride, that thing that you feel uh, when you see a movie that you just feel like you've been taken somewhere, you've gone this adventure, it's like a roller coaster, it's emotional, uh, and you leave feeling better than when you got there. And that was something that I think, you know, given his vision of the future was Ron very intent, which is to give you some hope. Okay, almost done.
Yo tengo dos preguntas, son para que eh, La primera es, después de cuatro años, pues salas y llegas a esta, esta película y la presentas. ¿Cómo fue el proceso? Eh, ¿Cómo ves a lo mejor la transición de hace cuatro años de Yeye a cuatro años después? Eh, ¿Cómo te encuentras con la franquicia? No sé, ¿qué aprendes? ¿Cómo creces? Y la segunda sería, ¿qué dice el Netflix eh, para hacer a este personaje? Pues, antagónico dentro de la historia, cómo llegaste a Penny, en qué proyecto lo viste, no sé, ¿no? ¿Qué fue lo que te gustó él para darle ese gran papel que muchos fans pues se hubieran aplaudido cuando apareció en la pantalla? Gracias. Uh, I would say that uh, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm learning uh, every day, every, every project. I'm very lucky to be working with a number of people, not just on this film, but in our other TV and film projects, who I feel like uh, I feel like we're all part of a kind of collective uh, learning from each other. When you make a movie like Star Trek Into Darkness, it's so big. Uh, the scope of it, the scale of it, is so enormous that part of the challenge is just figuring out literally how to do it. And it, it, it took every lesson I've ever learned in every project I've ever done uh, to apply it to this, just to figure out how to do it. Uh, the different looks, the different worlds, uh, the, 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 the many different characters, keeping things uh, moving. The, the, the challenge was so enormous that I was grateful for every job I've ever had, and I knew very well going into it, I hadn't had enough jobs to really teach me how to make this movie, but we would learn along the way. Um, and uh, I would say that uh, in terms of um, Benedict, uh, You know, we were looking for the great actor for this role, and we saw a lot of terrific actors and had great meetings. And then David Lindelof said, we should check out Sherlock, which is a BBC show which I've never seen. And I watched Sherlock and my jaw and the floor, and uh, he was amazing. And so we reached out to him in the audition, and it was over. And it was an incredible thing having Benedict come in to work with this group, it was a pre-existing, you know, family. And like with, you know, Alice and, and also Peter Weller, it was a very cool thing to see the, the family get bigger and expand. Uh, Benedict is an extraordinary, extraordinary actor. He was one of the greatest I, I was definitely had the chance to work with and I think that everyone here would agree. He was just, you know, an amazing uh, partner in crime, uh, literally for him. Um, He would feel things on the set. No, he, um, no, he was really an amazing, uh, amazing guy to work with. And, and I think that he does that extraordinary thing, which is his, his character is terrifying, intimidating, physical, brilliant, manipulative, but he's also oddly relatable. He has a sympathy. He has a, it is kind of the thing that was so beautiful and surprising. Um, so I, you know, I can't speak for everyone here when I said, you, you know, we were so lucky to, to get him. And, Bueno, vamos a empezar mañana en un segundo. Ok, número nueve. Mi nombre es Jorge Mendoza, soy de, el director de espectáculos. Quiero preguntarle a Jay Abraham, por favor, contésteme eh, de la tripulación del Star Trek es multicultural, están todas las razas ahí incluidas. Dice eh, que Roberto Jorge es quien hizo la adaptación de este filme y es mexicano. ¿Qué nos puede contar acerca de ello? Gracias. About, about Orsi? Yeah. Well, uh, <clears throat> he was supposed to be here today, um, and then I had some emergency meeting thing he had to go to. I, I sent him this email, I said, you know, wow, oh, it's Mexico. <laughs> What's going on? It's the country of your people. Where, where are you? You have to be here. We need you, you know. I'm so sorry, you know, that's not acceptable. It's Mexico. <laughs> I, I, I can't believe he's not here, honestly. Uh, He is the greatest. I, I, I was very lucky to hire Alex Crispin and Bob Orsi, or um, their writing team and now producing team, uh, on the TV show Alias. And they came in and they were, I think, like uh, sort of low-level writers, mid-low level. And they came in and within, I don't know, a couple of months, I realized that these two were just spectacular and that they were so talented and had such great ideas. And very quickly they were uh, with me as executive producer on the show, 
and were really co-running the show for as long as they were on it. Uh, I called them immediately when I did Mission Impossible 3 to write the script uh, with me. When Star Trek came along, I knew that Bob was a huge Star Trek fan, so he was the first person I called to say, you want to do this? Um, working with, with Bob, you know, is, uh, is always a joy. He's, he's incredibly uh, brilliant. I, I turn to him all the time for, you know, help with things. Um, and I would say he's, uh, he's also a, an amazing conspiracy theorist. And he's so smart that he can make you believe anything. <laughs> I'm telling you, like just 20 minutes, 45 minutes with him, you will be 100% certain that the government has done things that you, know, <laughs> you would never have thought you would believe. Uh, so he's a terrific guy to work with and a, a, a wonderfully uh, creative guy. And, you know, obviously could not be more successful. I mean, the work that they're doing uh, is, is incredible. So he's a terrific guy. And I wish he was here today. I know he does too. Bueno, por cuestiones de tiempo, tenemos que hacer una pregunta más. Una pregunta más. ¿Ok? Sí, sí, sí. Yo digo Hola, buenas tardes. Por Carlos García, de por Reforma 1. Tengo dos para cuatro. La primera es: eh, hace tiempo, eh, sin redes sociales, era pensado en tener una retroalimentación, como dicen ahora, de Twitter con Facebook. Para ustedes, como figuras públicas, que veo que son las reflexiones, tanto que se es interoficial, ¿les interesa lo que dice la gente? ¿Cómo se dan cuenta de qué piensan su trabajo? Y la otra es: ¿ustedes creen que en algún futuro la tecnología se entrenará o seguirá avanzando e irá o seguirá aislando al ser humano, como parece que lo está haciendo ahora con tanto más? Um, bueno, creo que es no, es un momento difícil escucharte, pero si me desvío, por favor, me das para eh, En términos a la, a la, a la media, eh, es, un, es un buen eh, privilegio eh, el, el poder tener contacto directo con las personas que te siguen y también el poder tú, transmitir noticias eh, y eventos, porque no solamente eso se usa para publicidad y para el entretenimiento, también se usa para para compartir noticias impactantes con el momento que están pasando. Creo que eso es, ¿cómo se dice tú en español? Una herramienta sumamente eh, importante cuando se usa bien. Eh, eh, para mí, pues, tuve un tiempo para adaptarme a esto porque soy un poquito antiguo y mi, gracias a Dios, mi, mi hermana es más tecnológica que, que yo y, y puede ayudarme a hacer esas cosas, pero yo poder contactarme con, la, con mis fans directamente es bueno porque me mantiene very grounded, pero también no es bueno uno irse muy profundo a eso, es como el colesterol, me gritan muy bueno mi hermano. Entonces, ahí, ahí, es, ahí es bueno. Pero eh, eh, creo que nuestro, nuestro destino en la vida es crecer y evolucionar. La tecnología es es como what is the word, it's, um, va a seguir evolucionando, quiera uno o no. Lo que tenemos que hacer como seres humanos es controlarla y no dejar que nos control, que la, la, la tecnología nos controle. Sí hay un aislamiento, en mi opinión, llega un momento que afecta a muchos seres humanos y empieza también con criaturas bien pequeñas, los vienen jugando video games y hablando en internet, una vez se lo impide a ellos a fisicalizarse, conectarse y socializar. Y eso es algo que les les es una desventaja. Así que tenemos que nosotros ser los que controlamos la tecnología y que nunca nos controle como dice quien me dice. Ah, esto es I think that's true. Uh, the children need to still um, be in contact with each other in the playground and stuff. And, um, the same again for the um, the world of you know international communication on the web. It terrifies me um, mainly because you, you have to be disciplined about it. Um, because if you're not disciplined about it, you end up knowing things about people you haven't seen in 20 years which is such weird information to have in your head. I knew my friend was getting married in Portugal and I haven't seen her in 20 years. So then I had to leave Facebook. But um, I, I think that it can be useful to, you know, communicate, if, if, um, if, for example, to communicate positive things and to share opinions. And then, as Joey as said again, you know, that's a huge part of our evolution as a species. We're going to become um, very different. Uh, the more we can communicate and be uh, a global culture.
And then I learned that there is a 3D printer, which is true, isn't it, DJ? So you can put a gun into a printer and you can print it. This, I think, is bad. I think it's so terrifying. <laughs> Technically, you don't put the gun in the printer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if you do that, you would have a gun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not a big fan of those media This is not my thing, but I can obviously see how it's uh, beneficial uh, to communicate uh, things and, um, um, and for business and whatnot. And then, in terms of technology, I would agree with Zillian, it seems to be happening. It's the march of humanity, uh, on it goes. But I do think that as we get more and more things to, to play with, to occupy our brain space, I'm sure our, you know, our brains will develop in um, relationship to that. But I also wonder how kids and how like, the new generation will be able to really, like, look people in the eye and have a, a conversation at length or sit in the theater and watch a play when there's so many different things to to occupy uh, their life, but uh, uh, I think Ray Kurzweil is a great way to, uh, a great place to start with fantastic documentary about all of us. I don't personally have a, uh, a Twitter account, but Bad Robot, uh, our company does, and on occasion I will tweet things there, but uh, I honestly don't know how some of the people who I know do it, because it's, it's a lot of time that goes into that, and I'm always amazed when I realize how how much is being uh, real time reported um, and how much is actually necessary. Uh, but in terms of technology, uh, I think that it is a complete double edged sword, and the obvious downside to the fact that we all in our pockets carry the communicators that were complete fantasy uh, when Star Trek was uh, created in 1966 uh, is that you see obviously walking down the street everyone is doing this and it's just creepy it's the weirdest thing and it's increasingly culturally acceptable to just do that so I think it's really good for you and the people you're not with but it's a disaster for the people you're actually in the room with. Um, the fact that you're all looking in this direction while looking at you is a rarity. It requires a press conference to actually look people in the eyes. <laughs> so uh, while I love the ability that, that, that technology has democratized access to filmmaking uh, tools and the distribution of, of those tools for people to find uh, commonality and, and connections when they feel alone. Uh, all, all the good, I think, is balanced by what is frightening about it and what what uh, what can transpire when people have access to that kind of um, amount of peace. But I would say that uh, you know that it's an amazing thing when you think about when Gene Roddenberry created Star Trek that communicator, there were some things that were completely fantasy that are so common now, and I really do think it can be fascinating to see in the not too distant future how many more of the ideas that, that he came up with proved he was prescient and, and showed that uh, we're actually on the path to transporting and space travel and all these things that I think would make Star Trek a very real thing and not, not a fantasy. Obviamente terminamos por poder hemos tenido la presencia de los actores y del director.